take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter number 2, all the way towards the back of your Bibles, close to Revelation. I'm expecting great things from God today because I tell you what, the devil has had his time trying to fight and discourage in a lot of different ways, uh, build the baptistry up. Uh, yesterday, of course, take about two hours to fill it up, and um, and then I went to go turn uh, the pump on and the heater, and no water was pumping. And I thought, uh, okay, this is a problem. So then I went and got a plunger, and I'm sitting there plunging, trying to see if there's anything unclogged. Well, the top hole there, because it cycles through from the bottom, pulls out, blows out the top, and we couldn't get anything out of it. So. Uh, I went home, got changed, and got my shorts on and went in there in the baptistry, and I'm down there in the water, plunging the bottom, and, and I could see stuff moving, the water's moving, and I thought, well, nothing's clogged in there, and the pump still wasn't working. And uh, So then I had to drain the baptistry and had to take the pump apart, and for whatever reason, there wasn't anything in the motor, it just, it just stuck temporarily, and I uh, got it unstuck, and everything was running good, put it back together, fill it back up, there it goes. I thought, well, at least we have you know nice and warm water for the baptism, and uh, then we had internet issues last night, and uh, and I thought, okay, well I'm just going to go over in the morning see if everything sticks. I came over about 6:30, uh, checked, make sure the water was warm, it was good and warm. Then I checked uh, the internet, and I was able to print find. Well, by the time I got to the bulletins, uh, I went back home, got ready for church, and, and got the bulletins done. Well, the internet, the printer would not connect to the internet. I thought, what in the world is going on? So about three minutes before the service, the bulletins were finally starting to print out this morning. And I just thought, well, this is just one of those days. And then I come out and I see our clock back there. The time was off. And I thought, oh, great. Uh, now I've got to change this because once the battery starts dying, the time gets worse and worse and worse as the day goes on. And I thought, well, I'm definitely not going to know what time it is. And I still don't know what time it is. It says 2.35 right now. But I went and changed the battery, and of course that's an atomic clock. Once you change the battery, it takes a while for it to reset back to its original time. And so I thought, well, what else is going to happen? Well, then I started preaching, and I got up to preach, and the sound, I forgot to turn the sound on. So we have to turn it on back there before we get here, so I'm trying to direct Kevin through all that. And I thought, man, what else could happen today? I'm expecting the Lord, you're just going to do some great stuff. And then we had an offering plate missing. <laughs> it was like, well, that's about fitting. This is good. It's all right. You know, it's like, okay, uh, we're going to have revival service today. I'm expecting this altar to be full. And uh, I don't know how many people's going to get in that water back there, but we're going to probably have more than just one. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm excited to see what God's going to do. And, uh, you know, when the devil, sometimes we ought to get concerned when the devil's not fighting. Yeah, we really ought to be concerned. The devil's going to fight. Anytime you try to make a step forward for God, uh, the devil's going to try to discourage. He's going to try to hold you back. And I'm going to just tell you right now ahead of time because I know, and I mentioned this, I think, uh, maybe about a year ago, uh, the devil obviously has been fighting in the church, but he's been fighting in individual families in the church as well. And it's happened, I mean, just un, I mean, just crazy things, un- uh, fathomable things that's just taking place and you're like, why is this taking place? And it's been one thing after another after another. So don't think it's just you. Don't think it's just you. That's what the devil wants to do is isolate you and try to get you to think, oh, you're doing something. Well, if you're doing something wrong, obviously just you know, get that right. I'll talk about that tonight. Uh, just confess it, get it taken care of and move on. But you know what? <clears throat> He's been fighting all of us and that's a good thing. Yes, yeah, because we're going forward for God. We're just trying to do what he wants us to do. And, of course, I was looking at the attendance today. I know we're down. We've actually been down in this service. We've been down a couple of weeks. And uh, that can get discouraging. But the morning service, of course, has been increasing in number. And, uh, and I thought, well, Lord, are we doing anything with having these split services? You know, because this is where we at. Let's just go back and put the services back together. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God is like, did I tell you to do that? He's like, all right. I guess I'll quit complaining more. I'll just do what you want to do until you change it. So uh, I don't know how long God wants us to do this. And it might be if for nobody else's benefit. It might be for whatever reason for me. Uh, God's trying to teach me through something through all this. So we'll do it as long as God wants us to do it. And we'll just keep uh, you know, trusting him. 
And I think as long as we obey him, he is going to continue to bless us. So we're going to talk a little bit about that here this morning. First uh, John chapter 2, verse number 3. <clears throat> this is a great book here. First John chapter 2, verse number 3, though, is where we'll begin reading. It says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I've simply been titled this message here this morning, What Does a Real Christian Look Like? This is a great book here, and 1 John is a book that we often, uh, it actually has several, uh, not just these, we're going to look at three here this morning, but it has several what we call birthmarks of a believer, uh, things that are evidenced in a Christian's life. The only birthmark of a believer that you don't find in this one book is what we find in the book of Hebrews, and that is the chastening of the Lord, and uh, that's the only one you don't find here. But all of the other ones you find right here in this book, we're going to look at three this morning. And the three we're going to look at this morning are the ones the world ought to see in us. You know, there are some birthmarks that the world may not see, other Christians may not know that's there because it's just something that's in us. But there are evidences here of these three things that the world ought to see. It ought to be evidence to everybody, hey, that person's a believer in Jesus Christ. And so these things are here. We're going to look at what they are uh, here as we pray. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. And Lord, I do pray that you will guide and direct our time together. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you might uh, speak to us. I pray that, Lord, our hearts will be encouraged to this message. I pray that, uh, Lord, we'll be lifted up, we'll be challenged and changed to be more like our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we are so thankful to see uh, people obeying you and and just doing what you want them to do. And Lord, that's what we all need to do, is just simply obey. We may not always understand why things happen the way they do and what exactly is going on. But Lord, help us to simply trust you and obey. And Father, we just pray and ask these things. And Lord, whatever the need is here today, we pray that you'll take care of it. I pray if there be anybody here in our service, or maybe there's one watching on Facebook or YouTube later. Lord, if they are not sure that heavens are whole, that, Lord, they will get saved before it's eternally too late. Father, we ask all this now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, here in this book, you know, this book and these three things we're going to look at is are going to show us what a real Christian ought to look like. And there's something I want you to notice here in this passage I just read. God's Word is very important with what He says. <laughs> And how he says something, I want you to look at verse 4. Notice how the verse starts. The first three words to verse 4 say what? He that saith. Look at verse 6. He that saith. Look at verse 9. He that saith. You see, we can say things all we want, but sometimes it really doesn't mean a whole lot, does it? Just because we say something doesn't make it so. There was a, a man who walked into a psychiatrist's office, and uh, as he was in the office there, he talked to the nurse, and the nurse went back to talk to the doctor and said, Doctor, there's a man out here in the office, and he says he's invisible, and he wants to see you. And the psychiatrist looked up and said, Well, tell him we can't see you. There, some of you got it. Some of you are still catching up. <laughs> it's like, can you say that again? <laughs> but you know, just because somebody says something doesn't make it so. We have a world today, people are saying they are a man when they're a woman. They're saying they're a woman when they're a man. Just because they say something 
doesn't make it so. We have people today saying they're a dog when they, in reality, maybe they think they're a cat. You know, we actually, we laughed at people like this 10 years ago. We actually sent them to a mental hospital because there was a problem, and there still is a problem. But just because somebody says something doesn't change the facts. We can say we love God. We can say we're a Christian. But just saying it doesn't make it so. So what should we look for? What should be there in our life? If we are a born-again believer, these three things here are definite. They are obvious. They ought to be there in our life. And so let's look at what they are. First of all, in verse 3 and 4, a true believer submits to the lordship of Christ. A true believer submits to the lordship of Christ. Verse 3 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, we cannot be saved without receiving Christ as Lord. Matter of fact, Romans 10 9 talks about uh, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 16, uh, verse, uh, I think it's verse 9, also talks about the same thing. It talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's believing on the Lord. You have to receive him not just as Savior, but you have to receive him as Lord as well in order to get saved. Now, once you get saved, you may not live like Christ is always your Lord. But in order for you to get saved, that's the way it had to start. You can't just get saved and say, well, I just don't want to go to hell. God, please save me, but I still want to do my life and live my life the way I want to live it. I'm sorry, you're not saved if that's the case. But when you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and <coughs> as Savior, that's where salvation begins. Now, once you get saved, then you may struggle with who is master of your life. Because that old fleshly nature wants to rise its ugly head and wants to do its own thing and have its own way. And that's why we're told over and over again, you know, Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Jesus said it this way. He said, you cannot serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. You're either going to hate the one and love the other or despise the one and hold to the other. We can't serve two masters. We have to choose who we're going to serve. And as a Christian, we ought to choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what God would have us to do. So uh, it is a contradiction to say that Christ is your Lord and you don't keep his word. That's a contradiction. You can't say he's your Lord and then you don't obey him. Matter of fact, John says it this way. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, you are a liar. He doesn't say you are mistaken, or you might be wrong, or you may want to rethink that. He says you are a liar. If that's, that's a pretty strong language, and he's not mincing any words with that. Now, we're not talking about sinless perfection here. I want you to look at the word in verse 3 and 4. We see the word keep and keepeth mentioned here. That word keep is actually talking about, it means to guard as a treasure. Notice what it says in verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That means we guard his commandments as a treasure. We don't just look at him like, well, I can take it or leave it. We guard him as a treasure. We keep his commandments. And, and also sailors back at, you know, many, many years ago, they used to drive, uh, they steer their ships by the stars at night and by the day they could you know, tell where they're at based on where the sun was at on the horizon, the time of day and things like that. But when they would steer by the stars, if it was a cloudy night, they had to be very careful with where they were going because they could get off course in a hurry. But they had to wait until they could see where the stars were and that was how they would stay on course, where they were, where they were at. And they called this keeping the stars. When they would stay on course, they say, we're keeping the stars. That means they're staying on their path. Now, as a Christian, sometimes we can get off course, can't we? That's because we're not keeping God's commandments. We're off course. We need to stay on course and keep his commandments. We can't look at his commandments 
in a flippant way or in a careless way. Now, this is not teaching. Verse 4 here is not teaching salvation by works, okay? We can't be saved by works. I think you know that. You've heard that preached from this pulpit for years and years and years and years and years. And it's true. It's Bible. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And uh, Ephesians 2 says, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved by works. And that verse right here in verse 4 is teaching the same thing, that we are not saved by works. But look what it says. It says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Now that little phrase there, I know him, that is actually past tense. That's like something that you've done in the past. I know him. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you say, hey, I've had a time in my life when I put my faith and trust in Jesus. This is talking about you. It's talking about me. This is in the past. I know him. But look at the next phrase. It says, and keepeth not his commandments. In the Bible, when you see a word that has E-T-H on the end of it, that means it is present tense. It's ongoing. So it's saying here that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior in the past, you say that you know him, and you are presently not keeping his commandments, you are a liar. Something's wrong. That's what he's saying. And again, that's pretty strong language. Now what this verse here is not saying, it is not saying, I am keeping his commandments so that I may know him. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying I'm working for my salvation. I'm keeping his commandments so that I may know him. It is saying because I know him, I'm going to keep his commandments. That's what that verse is really saying. Take hold your place here. Take your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John. Same writer, different book. The Gospel of John. Turn to chapter 14, if you would. John chapter 14. So the first mark of a Christian, the first evidence of a Christian is a true believer submits to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus is speaking here. And listen to what Jesus said about his commandments. He says, if ye love me. Now, how many times have you heard people say, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. But their life does not line up with God's word. I mean, I've seen it for years. I've had it in my own life. Oh, you know, God, I love you, I love you. But there's things in my life that maybe shouldn't have been there. I had to get them right. I had to take care of them. Jesus said, if you love me, then do what? Keep my commandments. Guard as a treasure my commandments. Obey the things that I'm telling you to do. Skip down if you would in verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will do what? Keep my word. Do you see how important this is to God? If you're saying you love Jesus, then keep his words. And my Father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Look at verse 24. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my saying. You see, this is taught over and over and over again through the word of God. But it's so very important. A Christian, somebody who claims to be a Christian, somebody who says, yes, I'm, I'm born again. I'm washed by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord for that. But you better submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not what you want in life that's important. It's what does God want for you. It's kind of like these split services. I'm going to tell you what, it wears me out on Sunday morning. And there's a lot of different ways we can do it, but God hasn't given me liberty to do it any other different way right now. And I was even thinking this morning, with all this stuff going wrong, I thought, Lord, it would be so easy just to go back and have an 11 o'clock service and have an all of us here and you know, it would be encouraging. I know we've had some sick folks the last couple of weeks. I was like, it would be so easy to do it. And the Lord basically just said, would you quit complaining? That's what I was doing. That's what we do. We complain. And I had to stop and think, now, Lord, I know you're in control of all this. I don't understand why you're doing all this. It might be for my benefit. I just need to learn from it. But you know what? I'm just going to be thankful. And I'm just going to keep enjoying life until you change something. And really, that's the best attitude we can have. 
is just submit to his lordship because he understands. He knows what's happening. There might be somebody that we can reach in an 845 service we couldn't have reached in an 11 o'clock service. Maybe they couldn't make an 11 o'clock service, but they could that early. And they get their life changed for the glory of God. Would it be worth it? Sure it would. Maybe it won't happen until this spring. But praise God, it would be worth it all. So why are we complaining? It's because we don't know what God knows. But that's where we have to trust Him. We submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now take your Bibles, turn back to 1 John chapter 2. The second thing you have here, as a true believer in Jesus Christ, not only do we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but look at verse 6. A true believer seeks the lifestyle of Jesus. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walk. Now there's a little phrase there at the end of verse 6 that if you mark anything in your Bible, you ought to mark this phrase, as he. As he. You ought to put a box around it or do something. As he. As he. Because... Our point of comparison in this life is not one another. But isn't that what we often do sometimes? I know playing sports sometimes, you try to think, you think you're uh, you know, maybe a good player, and you're comparing yourself to maybe somebody else on the team that's maybe not quite as good. Or maybe you're playing against somebody, and you're playing against a team that's maybe not, and you think, man, I'm pretty good. Now, your point of comparison is all wrong. What is your point of comparison? Now, obviously, Jesus didn't play basketball. He didn't play baseball. He didn't play football. So we can't use that type of point of comparison. But until you are at a professional level where you're ready to get paid for this, that becomes your point of comparison. You find perfection, and that becomes your point of comparison. Well, in the Christian life, what is our point of comparison? That is perfection. It is Jesus Christ himself. As he. Everything is as he. What would Jesus do? How would he live this life? Uh, and this goes back to what Dave was talking about in the adult Sunday school class. It goes back to our heart. If God has your heart, he will have everything else in your life. He'll have your checkbook. He'll have your time. He'll have your family. He'll have everything else in your life if he has your heart. And that's what God wants more than anything else. You can write a big check put it in the offering plate. God's not as concerned about that as he is having your heart. You can give God all your time and serve him in this ministry and that ministry and that ministry and that ministry. But if he doesn't have your heart, it doesn't mean you're as much. You can do all kinds of things. You can have 50,000 kids and just send them all off to Bible college. It doesn't mean as much to God if he doesn't have your heart. How do you know God has your heart? If you love Him, keep His commandments. You just simply obey what He wants you to do. What is it He's telling you to do? He says, I am your example. Follow me. So we see this phrase over and over again, as He, as He, as He. Look back if you would, uh, skip over if you would, the same book. Chapter 4, verse 17. Chapter 4, verse 17. <clears throat> it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that ye may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because, what's the next two words? As he. Because as he is, so are we in this world. You see, what does God expect from people who put their faith and trust in him? He expects you and I to be little Christ everywhere we go and whatever we do. Your job, your family, your home, your vacations, whatever you do, he expects there to be little Christ everywhere. And what's happening in our world today? They don't see little Christ, do they? <clears throat> Not like they should. That's where we can make a difference. It starts with us individually, personally. We can be little Christ. What type of lifestyle did Jesus Christ have? Well, he had a life of honesty. Skip back, if you would, to chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter 1, 
Chapter 1, verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, what's the next two words? As he, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. What does the light do? The light shines upon something that needs to be seen. It exposes something. Now, when I was, uh, I didn't tell you all this yet. Uh, I forgot about this till just now. But um, when I was emptying the baptistry, and I don't know if these things are even connected. <laughs> They're probably not. But as I was emptying the baptistry, and of course I was draining it out, and you know, I was waiting on it. It takes a while because you can't open the drain all the way because you know, it'll back up downstairs and all this other stuff. I was draining it out, and then I thought, well, you know, I've got to fix this pump. So I went down to the fill ball basement, got some tools. To fix the pump. And I went down there and there's water all over the basement floor. I'm like, what in the world? It's like, where did this water go? And I'm looking around and I go over uh, next to where the hot water heaters, because that's my first thought. I was like, great, the hot water heater just busted, you know, and everything's fine. It's dry, but the floor is still wet there. And I'm like, I actually see water run on the floor towards my feet. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm looking up and I'm checking the water pipes. I'm checking the plumbing. It's like, is there a leak somewhere? And I'm looking down at the floor. Of course, now I'm in, you know, past my 40s. I, I need specs all the time you know, to see things up close. But I'm looking here and it looks like I can see it. I can't tell if it's dripping or what it is down at the crack of the floor. And I'm sitting there looking at that. Thought, what is going on? Well, it was dark. It was under the table. So guess what I did? I pulled out my cell phone with a light and I shined the light on it. So now I can see better what's happening. <laughs> I still can't figure it out. <laughs> it was like coming through the wall. The crack, there wasn't a crack in the wall. It was like seeping through the block of the wall, all the way down the wall. It looked like little bubbles of water, and it was running across the floor over to the floor drain. I'm like, where is this water coming? Is it coming from the baptistry? Surely not. It's got to be coming from somewhere. What's happening here? But you know what? I couldn't see like I needed to see until I shined some light on it. And the Bible says here, Jesus... He is light. It says here in verse 7, but he, the, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. That means he is walking honestly. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing he's trying to get away with. We just need to be honest. Honest with ourselves. Honest with others. Honest with God. Also, if you look in verse chapter 3, just skip over to chapter 3 if you would. Chapter 3, verse 3. We're talking about the lifestyle of Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 3 says... And every man that hath this open him purified himself, even, what's the next two words? Even as he is pure. So the lifestyle of Jesus is, he is also pure. What does it mean to be pure? It means to not have any filth. Not have any filth. I noticed in Sunday school, I looked down at my shirt and I got some dirt or something here. And of course, already, I was afraid I was going to be sitting there soaking wet because usually I get wet when I baptize people. And uh, thankfully I didn't get wet, but somehow I got some smudge or something on my shirt from, uh, you know, baptizing, baptizing early this morning. I didn't know what happened. But, you know, that's filth. We have filth sometimes in our life. Sometimes it's the things we see on social media. It's the things we listen to the radio. It's the things we watch on TV. It's other things we allow in our life. It could be a book. It could be a magazine. It could be a lot of different things we have. We allow filth of the world into our life. That means we're not pure. Now, these things are not bad in and of themselves. They can be good tools. They can be good things to use for the glory of God. But if we are pure, we don't allow the filth in. Too many times as Christians, we let the filth come in and we don't think anything of it. The life of Jesus Christ was also a life of righteousness. Over in chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous." Even as he is righteous. I mean, we're talking about the lifestyle of Jesus. Some people say, well, yeah, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't cuss. Well, neither does a telephone pole. It doesn't do all that stuff. Doesn't mean it's righteous. What does righteousness mean? It means, what did Jesus do? He went about doing good. Are we spending our time doing good? Or are we just trying not to drink, not to smoke, not to cuss, not to do certain things? That might be staying pure from the, from the filth of the world, but it's not righteousness. Jesus did both of them together. You see, we need to have a life of righteousness. His was also a life of relinquishment. 
You say, what's that? That just means total surrender. Remember what Jesus prayed in the garden? He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He was God in human flesh. And he still was totally surrendered to the Father's will. Over in John chapter 15, I'd love to read the whole passage to you. It talks about abiding in the vine. And, uh, the vine, uh, or uh, if we abide in the vine, then we shall bear fruit. We, and so we can bring forth not just a little bit of fruit, so we can bring forth much fruit and more fruit. Why? The more we abide in the vine. Those, and when we do those things, you'll see in that same passage in verses 1 through 10, you'll see obedience. You'll see submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You'll see the next point I'm going to talk about, about loving Him and how God uses all that. But what you also see is that we are dependent on following Jesus Christ and living our lifestyle according to Him. You know, some people say, well, preach, I would love to serve the Lord. I would love to do all these things. But I've got a job. I've got a family. I've got... Well, if you're serving God the way you ought to serve Him, you'll serve Him at your job, too. Your family will also. You'll be serving Him with your family. You'll be serving Him in everything you do. When you go on vacation, you'll be serving the Lord. That is what we do. We serve God. Even when you're having a hobby and you're just enjoying yourself, you can still serve God. You say, well, I'm not passing out tracks. Well, you don't have to pass out tracks. You know, I can play golf and still serve God. I hit a bad shot. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for letting me see more of your creation. <laughs> And you're just walking, chasing your ball around. Whatever you do, you can serve God. You can have a right heart attitude is what I'm trying to say. With everything that we do, Jesus Christ also had a life of reliance, which I just mentioned about. He depended on the Father's will. So a true believer is going to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's going to seek the lifestyle of Jesus. But a true believer also shows the love of Jesus. This is what the world means. They need to see the love of Jesus. Look at verse 9 through 11 here in 1 John 2. It says, He that saith he is in the light, hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. We're talking about loving. Skip back to you with the verse 7. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye had heard from the beginning. What's the old commandment he's talking about here? Verse 7. Remember what Jesus said? He was asked, what are the, What's the greatest commandment? Remember what he said? He said <coughs> two. The two greatest commandments are, first of all, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What's the second one? To love your neighbor as yourself. Where did Jesus get that? Did he just make it up out of his head? No, he got it from the Old Commandment. What are the Old Commandments? It's what we just went through a Bible study on one of Sunday nights. Through the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is summing up the first four of those Ten Commandments. The next six commandments are about how we deal with our fellow man. Loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what he's talking about here. Is loving by the Old Commandment. That is what we're to do. But look at verse 8. Verse 8 says this, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Well, what's this new commandment he's talking about? This new commandment is found in John chapter 13, verse 34, when Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, even as I, see there it is again, as I also have loved you. That's following the lifestyle of Jesus. But it goes with our love as well. We ought to love one another. This love was a serving love. We ought to spend our time serving one another. Not serving ourselves. Serving one another. How can we please others ahead of ourselves? How can we live for them? How can we be an encouragement to them? How can we be a blessing to them? It is a sanctifying love. The word sanctify means to set apart. This type of love ought to set apart. How do we set apart Things like this with this type of love. Well, the way we do it is we lead by example and then we teach others how to love properly. That's why uh, I think it was in the book of Titus, I'm sorry, Timothy, he was instructed to teach the older women and they were instructed to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and how to love their children. 
I thought there was nothing more natural than a mother's love for her child. Why would they need to be talked in to love them? It's because there's more to it than just feeling that love. There's more to it than just a bond and a connection. It's teaching them to love in a proper way so they can also turn around and love others the way they should. But this love is also a steadfast love. John 13, 1. I love this verse in John 13, 1. Again, this is all John's writing all of these books here. John, the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. But he wrote in John chapter 13, he says, there at the end of the verse it says, He loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. Who was he talking about? Well, he was talking about Peter was in that group. Loud mouth, stick your foot in all the time. You stick your foot in your mouth. But Peter, that was him. He loved him unto the end. That was James and John. They were in that group. Remember what James and John, what their nicknames were? The sons of what? Son, they were actually the sons of thunder. That was what they were known as. But why? It's because they had a quick temper. They, I don't know if they were redheads or not, but they had a quick temper. <laughs> we know that their temper was very short, so they were known as the sons of thunder. They were in that group, and he loved them unto the end. We had Thomas doubting, cynical Thomas. Well, I'm not going to believe it until I see the print of nails and can thrust my finger in that and put my fist in the side. He loved him unto the end. It included Philip. Philip was kind of a manipulator, a calculator type individual. Andrew, he was in that same group. He was very quiet, very reserved. He loved him unto the end. Doesn't matter what their personality was. And you know who else was in that group? Judas Iscariot. He knew who was going to betray him. And he loved him unto the end. You see, if we're a real Christian, what the world needs to see from us is they need to see us submitted to the Lordship of Christ. They need us, they need to see us seeking to be just like Jesus in every area of our life. And they need to see us showing the love of Jesus to others. There are sometimes there are people that is hard to to love. But so are we. Sometimes we're that way. Your spouse doesn't have to love you just because they're married to you. Sometimes you're unlovable. Sometimes you're a jerk. Sometimes you're cantankerous. Your children don't have to love you just because they're your children. Your parents don't have to love you just because they're your parents. Sometimes we're simply unlovable. But I'm glad his love is all the way to the end. All the way. And that's how we're love. I wish I had time to tell you a story. And it was about a, a man just years ago. He was, I'll just tell you part of it. He was uh, an old miner. And there was a Welsh uh, preacher who came by. I can't remember the guy's name. Last name I think was Morehouse or something like that. He came by and he preached. Every message he preached was from John 3.16. All he did was preach about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Well, this old miner, he was a hard-nosed, cantankerous, I mean, just a nasty, filthy man. He beat his wife, beat his kids, I mean, cussed, drank, did everything. And he heard this preacher was in town. He says, okay, I'm going to fix this preacher. He purposed, he goes, he goes, that preacher may preach, but I'm going to pistol whip him out of town. He's never coming back here again. He came to church, and of course the people in the area, they knew, uh, and they tried to warn the preacher, that preacher, you need to leave town, you need to not be preaching tonight. This man's going to come, and he's going to hurt you, he's going to do harm to you. He said, I'm still going to preach. It's all in God's hands. Well, he started preaching, and as he began his sermon, here comes this man walking in the back. Sat down, pulled out his pistol, sat on his leg. Everybody knew what was coming. And the guy, before he sat down, he said, Preacher, you do your thing, and when you're done, I'm going to do mine. Well, the preacher, most people think the preacher started, when he started preaching, he was going to preach about God's wrath and God's judgment on sin. No, guess what he preached? John 3, 16. God's everlasting love. He finished preaching his message. The guy got up in the back, 
I think his first name was Ike. He got up from the back and he walked out. Didn't say a word. Just walked out. Everybody was shocked. He started walking down the road. He heard uh, this guy in a ring with prostitutes, drank in the bars, did all that stuff, had the prostitutes yell, Hey, all right, come up here. Come spend some time with us. We'll have a good time. He just ignored and kept walking. Had guys yelling at him from behind the saloon doors. Yeah, hey, all right, come on in here. We'll have a good time. We'll have some drinks. He just ignored and kept on walking. He went all the way home and just slung the door open. His wife and children in there, the wife he just beaten not too long earlier, his children started scampering like a bunch of squirrels and ass because they knew daddy was home, didn't know if he was drunk, wanted to beat them too. And they started hiding under the beds. The, the mother's trying to protect them, pulling out her skirt, trying to hide them underneath the bed. And he just said, woman, you don't need to do that anymore. You don't need to do that. I'm not here to beat you. I'm not drunk. I'm not here to beat the kids. He said, I'm here because I need to pray. Now, then on his knees, said, Dear Lord. And he stopped and paused for a while, and he looked up and said, I don't even know how to pray. So he went back to a prayer he learned as a little child. I can't remember how the prayer goes, but it was just a simple, childlike prayer. <coughs> receiving, if, you know, God loving him and receiving him just as he was. That man's life is completely changed from that day forward. You see, he got saved. What made the difference? Jesus. It was the love of God. Because an individual was not afraid to let his light shine. An individual was not afraid to keep preaching the truth. An individual was not afraid to keep stressing about who Jesus was, that we need to be like him, we need to love like him, we need to do these things like him. And because he was living his life like Jesus, it made a difference in another man's life. That's the way God intends it for you and for me. Let's keep living for the Lord. Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. And Lord, I pray that you will bless our invitation time now. I don't know what the need is in the hour, what you have for all of us, but Lord, I do know this. We all need you. We need you every hour of every day. Lord, we need you in every way. Father, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that does not know for sure heaven's their home, that, Lord, they'll get it settled here this morning before it's eternally too late. Lord, if there's someone else who just needs to make a decision for you, maybe we just kind of grown a little uh, careless in our Christian life. We haven't completely, totally submitted to the Lordship of Christ. Maybe we've been born again, but, but we're struggling with who is master of our life. Lord, I pray that the, here today we'll come and just say, Lord, you're master. It's not what I want, it's what you want for me. We need to get back to the joy of serving God. We need to get back to living our life like Jesus Christ as He is pure, as He is righteous. Lord, we need to have these things in our life as well. And Father, we need to also love not just you and not just say it, but we need to demonstrate it by our obedience, by our actions, by our serving, our teaching, and our example. Lord, we need to love you and love others. Father, I pray you help us now and so thankful, Lord.